Ladies and gentlemen, the Shrug Gaming Theatre Com video. Let us discuss Direct X12 for the Xbox One <laughs> yet again. This time, these comments come from Phil Spencer when he says, and I quote, it's not going to be a massive change. Now, let me say before we get into the video that I have done an article of this. It's not a requirement that you check it out, um, but I have done a couple of links to some other stuff to discuss if you require some context to this, mostly in regards to things we've previously discussed on the channel. For example, uh, Microsoft's AMD's Dev Days, I've linked to that in a few other bits. But the main thing I want to point out before we get into this is that I actually really respect Phil Spencer for these comments. I really do. Um, with so much lies and deception from certain studios that is going about at the moment, I think it's really refreshing, to be honest, that Phil's just come out and said, hey, you know what, here's what the situation is. I, I really feel that it's excellent from the perspective of Microsoft. So anyway, moving on to this, um, kind of uh, actually tackling it. Phil said via Twitter, it will help developers on the Xbox One, it's not going to be a massive change, but will unlock more capability for developers. That was pretty much it. So what he's basically saying is this is not going to be a situation where, I don't know, the GPU doubles in performance. We're not going to be getting 50% extra CPU performance. We're not going to be getting, um, you know, the equivalent of an extra 7 billion gigabytes of RAM. Okay, I'm just you know, throwing stupidity into the air because that's what some of this is, right? Some people have said that the system is going to almost become um, like four times more powerful uh, with the DirectX 12. In fact, there are still these rumors going about with like a hidden GPU, which is absolutely ridiculous at this point. To be honest with you, I don't, I don't really understand how that's come about either. On the other hand, there's also the opposite side. There's the anti-Microsoft side, which I. I think it's just as bad, where they're like, yeah, you know, with the update, it's going to do absolutely nothing. It's just going to increment the number, as in the version number of DirectX on the console. So we've discussed some stuff on this before regarding DirectX, and I still need to finish off my analysis because there's some stuff I still haven't covered. But some of the X12 features are embedded into the console already, right? But here's the thing. Certain features are not, but... The bottom line is the Xbox One is already fairly low level API. As I've discussed in the developers days, not only is there already DX12 features, but there's extensions. So DX11.1 um, or DX11.X, should I say, can run exactly the same code on a PC as the Xbox One. So in short, you create an indie game on um, a PC, you want to run that on the Xbox One, go for it my friend you just simply transfer the code over providing it doesn't require a lot of performance the code will basically run as is on the other hand if you are Ubisoft if you are Bethesda and you require the extra mileage you, you require the extra performance Microsoft via their SDKs provide extensions where you can go ahead and utilize low-level API access to the GPU so right there and then that's the difference between the xbox one and the pc the pc at least using dx11 right now just doesn't have that now obviously mantle does but we're not refer we're not speaking about mantle here we're instead focused on direct x so in that respect a like for like comparison you cannot do this is why i'm saying that pcs are ridiculously more powerful than consoles yes but co pcs also have right now have a lot of issues primarily direct x to be honest. Um, yeah, they're more expensive and stuff, but one of the primary problems with the PC is that you're not getting the full use out of the hardware. A lot of the time, it's just not being used as effectively as it should be. Uh, AMD are definitely suffering from that because, for example, their CPUs a lot of the time, they could have more cores than Intel, but because their IPC, their instructions per clock, in other words, the performance per core is generally lower than Intel, even if they're roughly running at the same clock speed. So, in other words, let's say a 4 gigahertz versus a 4 gigahertz, just for like for like comparison, Intel will usually win in games simply because, even though they've got fewer cores, let's say 4 versus 8, their IPC is higher, and oftentimes DirectX 12, uh, sorry DX11, is just running the main render on like one thread. And this is a lot of optimization. Mantle is trying to help this, but a lot of developers just aren't there yet. And obviously, from the perspective of PC gamers, 
DX12 is going to help because low level access in course is going to be a lot easier for the PC. So Phil has come out and said, here's what's going on, right? It's going to be a in performance improvement. He's not given a percentage. He's not said this is going to be like, I don't know, 8%, 15%. Instead he said, you know, it's, it's going to help, but it's not going to be like we're going to be seeing 1080p, uh, 60 frames per second on every game. So I, I applaud him for that. I applaud him for his honesty, um, which I think many in the tech industry already kind of knew this anyway. To be honest, but it's nice to see that he's publicly stated it. Another point that he's made, um, which is another thing that I actually quite like, is that he said um, in regards to first party titles, I don't think it's about specific genre, more about creating exclusive franchises. Taking some risks on third parties might not take, uh, might not take. Thing I ask of first party studios is why this is a first party game. What tech design or what creative difference we're trying to land, he continued. Uh, that was also via some tweets. If there was one criticism, this is outside of uh, comments, if there was one criticism I could levy at all three hardware uh, studios, then I was Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo, a lot of the titles were, well, sequels, right? So you had Infamous Second Son, First Light, you had. Uh, Halo, you had another Zelda game and so on. And I'm not saying that this is bad, but new IPs and new directions in technology are good. And I do criticise Microsoft for some of their decisions regarding the Kinect and the Xbox One as a whole. On the other hand, at least they tried something different, I suppose. Um, and this is the thing. The reason you buy a console, the reason you'd buy an Xbox One if you've got a PlayStation 4, the reason you'd buy a PlayStation 4 if you've got an Xbox One, or hell, the reason you'd buy a console as well as or instead of a PC is because of the exclusives on it. So in other words, yeah, the PlayStation 4 might have more pixels, for example, or slightly better quality pixels on screen, but that doesn't really mean much if there aren't exclusives, and I'm not saying that's not the case, I'm just merely pointing out. Let's assume that there were no first-party games on the PS4, it's a stupid example, but still, every single one of the first-party games on the PS4 sucked, or you're not interested in them. That's another option. You just might not be interested in Infamous Second Son. You might not be interested in Drive Club or whatever. You might just instead be interested in Gears of War, you might be interested in Halo, you might be interested in Forza, whatever. That, those are the reasons you're going to pick up the system, and this is what I agree with Microsoft. Personally, I don't really like the look of Sunset Overdrive. I seem to be in the minority here, however. Um, a martyr on the channel has said, I don't understand how you can not like it. She's basically disagreed with me on that, and there's a couple of other people as well. Uh, Dave, also known as Big Boss on the channel, said the same thing. Uh, Murasaki said, I really like the game. I, on the other hand, just don't find it interesting. On the other hand, I will say that I thought Fable looked really impressive, and I thought Halo looked really impressive. So, going away from the rambling and getting to my point, it's down to the first party studios to say, this is what's possible on our system. This is what's possible um, for game studios to do. This is what's possible for gamers to play and this is why you should buy our system the exclusives and I personally really applaud that um, I'm not saying that Sony aren't doing the same thing obviously they've got their um, first parties as well for example Naughty Dog working The Last of Us on the PS4 and I was a huge fan of it on the PS3 but let's, let's even talk about th them for a second one of the main causes of concern when the PS3 was first unleashed onto the world was what the hell this is too hard to program for what the hell the SDK suck what the hell how do you get the most out of the system and then Sony's first party said well this is what's possible see the system is powerful it's just hard to use and then with that knowledge Sony worked with their uh, ICE team in other words the SDK developers and API developers and they released different conferences and produced different conferences for games developers and said this is how you get the most out of this, this is how you get around the memory problems, this, and this is basically what happens. Because a lot of the time it's not just down to the first party studios to say this is how, you know, to create an interesting design of a game. 
a lot of the time, for example, Killzone, one of the reasons that Sony put out the uh, Shadowfall post-mortem is that we're actually using it not only to lure in developers, in other words, ooh, look at the performance of the PS4, but also it, it served as a good technical demo of what the system could do, and also it served as a lot of knowledge to for Sony to give out this information, like obviously in confidence, to studios, so in other words the studios could understand. And as I was discussing in the Developers Day conference, which is linked um, in the article that I've also linked in this video, Microsoft assume a four-stage tier adoption of ES RAM. It's like the first couple of tiers are pretty much like, yeah, you're going to be doing that pretty instantly with the console. The second two tiers, however, are going to take longer, and they believe that by the, like, the time the third and fourth wave of games, in other words, you know, the fourth generation of titles come out, so obviously the first generation would be like Rise and so on, and then second generation would probably be like Titanfall, and now we're moving on to like the third and fourth generation games. Those are the ones that are going to understand better how to utilize the ESRAM, how to get the most of out of it, for example, rendering from both uh, DDR3 and ESRAM at the same time to save memory bandwidth and uh, to reduce uh, render targets and other bits and bobs. So anyway, I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully you found it somewhat informative. If you can give ye old comment or ye old thumbs up, I would be very grateful. Anyway, I'll see you soon. Take care and bye for now.